Tell them. Raisin. Aaron. Really one of the stupidest things I've ever heard in my life. Bell.
why do I know? Because you write it like a five-year-old child. Okay? You're adults now, right? Are you adults or babies? Adults. You sure? What was that? You're what? Are you adults or babies? Adults. Adults, right? You're adults, right? Yeah? Cabbage, I'm not sure about you. Maybe still a little bit of baby, I don't know. And we'll see, we'll see, I don't know. But, do it professionally, okay? I mentioned this before, I think, in hygiene and safety, about habits, right? Good habits and bad habits, right? If you develop bad habits now, later, it's going to be very hard to change those bad habits, right? So now is the time to develop good habits, writing professional emails, doing things properly, right? That's the Nothing is entirely 
entirely sour. There's elements of, think about a piece of fruit, right? So a lemon is a fruit, right? An apple is a fruit, right? Right. Which one is sweeter? An apple or a lemon? Right. But a lemon still has sugar. Okay? What about an onion? Onion's a vegetable, correct? Which one has more sugar? An onion or an apple? An onion. Onions have more sugar than apples. Okay? Than most apples. Some apples have more sugar, but the majority of apples have less sugar than an onion. But when you eat it, would you take an onion and just eat it like an apple? No. Who would? That's stupid, right? It's crazy. I've seen some do that. It's hilarious, right? Not for them, but for me, because I was watching. But my point is that everything has elements of flavor, right? And taste is based on elements, right? You understand? Elements. Yeah. So there's chemicals in food that give it taste. There's chemicals in food that give it color, right? So all these chemicals make up the flavor and the taste. Okay? And the color. But all things have different elements of taste. And so that's what we could, what we could, when we say something like a term like flavor profile, that's the, the profile of taste. What, what taste does it have? So for example, if I were to say like, oh, a lemon, oh, it's sour. Okay, but what else is it? Right? Sour is one part of its profile. Right? There's other parts to it, right? A lemon has a fragrance, right? Right, the, the smell of lemon, right? There's also the sourness, there's some sweetness to it, okay? So when you're talking about taste, there's a, an entire profile of taste, not just one taste, all right? <clears throat> so, as I said, um, horseradish is um, a direct relative of wasabi. It's a, a root vegetable, okay, or a tuber, so it grows underground. Um, so like a carrot, right? Have you guys ever seen how a carrot grows? Right, grows in the dirt and the leaves come up out of the ground. That's why a carrot is one color and its leaves are a different color. Have you ever, have you ever thought about that? Why, why, is, why is a carrot orange and its leaves green? Right, because the carrot lives underground away from sunlight and the leaves live above ground. So the sun goes to the leaves, there's a chemical process called photosynthesis where um, chlorophyll exchanges with sunlight and becomes energy for the plant. Horseradish is the same way. It grows underground, leaves grow above ground. The leaves of horseradish are less commonly used, okay? although some restaurants now use them because restaurants now are trying to become uh, sustainable. You understand the word sustainable? You understand that word? You don't understand the word sustainable? Can anyone explain? What's your name? Rita. Huh? Rita. Oh, Rita, yes. Can anyone explain to Rita what uh, sustainable means? You can, you can use Chinese if you want. It's easier. Can anyone explain what is sustainability? Sustainable? Nobody can explain what that means? Because you were nodding, you said, yeah, I know what it means. And now I ask you to explain it again. I don't know. Nobody can explain what that means? Do you understand the word sustainable? Yes or no? No. No, okay. Perfect. Be honest, by the way. If I ask you a question, if you understand something, and you say yes, or you don't say anything, that means to me you understand, right? If you don't understand, you have to say something. Don't, don't be afraid or scared or whatever. You know in Taiwan, they have this thing about like losing face? You know what I mean? Right? Forget that. That's bullshit. Okay? It's so stupid. That's half the problem in Taiwan is I don't want to lose face. Oh, I don't want to lose face. And so most people here, they don't accept things. They don't admit things when they're wrong. When they make a mistake, they're with someone else and someone else's fault. Yeah. This whole thing about losing face is idiotic. It's a hundred year old stupidity. We live in 2021. The 
future. Yeah. If you don't understand something, say, I don't understand. So then I can explain it. Okay? Because if you don't say something, that means to me, you understand it. At least, Rachel said, I don't know. Right? So that's great. I asked, do you understand what sustainability says? He must Right? He admits he doesn't know. That's fine. That's why you're here, right? To learn these things, yeah? So if I ask you something and you don't know, say, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's okay. That's right. All right? So please, if you don't understand, don't say you understand. Say, I don't understand. Sustainability. I'll give you an example. Who here likes to eat fish? Fish. You guys know what fish are, right? Yeah? Who likes to eat fish? Only two people. You don't like fish? You don't like fish? Really? It's insane. You like fish? Alright. You, you, you don't eat fish. Ever? Your parents must be very unhappy with you. Alright. Well, that's weird. I, I pretty much everyone in Taiwan eats fish. But this is an island, right? So, there's a lot of fish. Anyways, so, we like to eat fish, except for... Uh, is it a good idea just to keep fishing and fishing and fishing from the oceans as much as we want? Is that a good idea? Just keep taking fish from the ocean? Oh, so much fish! Ah, it's a good idea? Why not? Why is that a bad idea? Eventually, there will be no fish, correct? So that's not sustainable. Sustainable means that we can continue to go, right? You understand what I mean? So now, what we have instead of fishing from the ocean, we have something else. Where do we get fish from? You see them all over Taiwan. You drive down. Ping Dong, Hong Chuan, you see them drive down the Pending on the side of the road, you see the big ponds, right? What's in those ponds? Fish. Fish farms, right? So that is making fish sustainable. So for example, um, one type of fish in North America was, a lot of it was caught, right? They, they pulled so much in the ocean. But the government said, okay, wait a minute, we have a problem. We have to stop fishing. This, this type of fish, you can't fish anymore for 10 years. So, and the government went around and checked all the fishing boats. You know, if, you, if you bring that fish in, you got a big, big fine, you pay a lot of money. 10 years so that the fish can replenish, right? They can have more little fish and the fish become big fish, right? So that now that fish is more. Uh, populated, right? Before it was almost extinct. Some species of fish are gone from the earth because of us, right? Because we fish so much that some species of fish they don't exist anymore. Even in my in my life, I've seen a species of fish and you can't get it anymore. It's gone forever, right? So sustainability is also a big factor. Food now, so. Sorry, sometimes when I talk about these things, I, I go into different subjects, okay? But it's important that you understand fully the, the scope of, you know, the world of food, okay? I often find uh, in Taiwan, sometimes a little only focused on Taiwan. You look at the news, right? And I, my wife is family, so we watch the news at home. It's only Taiwan, the news. Not much about the world, just Taiwan, China, Taiwan, China, China, that's it. New news stuff, oh wow, new news story, but that's the news, right? Not much about the world. So it's important that you understand really what's going on outside of this island, right? Because it affects us, right? Living here, the world affects us, right? So sustainability, as I said, horse radish, some people use the leaves because they want to use all of the product. Okay? Instead of buying something and getting rid of it at the top, they try to use the whole thing. Okay? Horseradish is um, really common as a, a sauce, similar to the way that wasabi is used in Japanese food. Okay, so Japanese
Chinese cuisine. Often wasabi is served with um, sashimi, okay, or with uh, nigiri sushi, okay, or it's used in the making of different uh, mac and cheese rolls, right? Horse radish is similar in German food or Austrian cuisine in that it's often served with a lot of meat, okay, as a as a side dish, okay. Uh, it's also commonly used to make sauces, okay. So when we get into butchery class next semester, and also Western cooking the semester after, uh, we will use horseradish in some different applications. Okay. Um, for example, in butchery class next semester, we'll make German sausages. Okay. So um, a few different kinds of German sausage, and we'll use some horseradish uh, with the sauce for those sausages. Okay. Uh, another really common thing is these little these little things right here. These are called juniper berries. Um, they look a lot like blueberries. Um, they're about the same size as blueberry. Um, however, they don't taste anything like blueberries. They have a very unique taste. They're often uh, sold in dry form. Uh, so I have these. I have these downstairs. So I'm going to wait until most of the class is here. Because now we have about half the class, less than half the class, right? Um, so I think by mid-November, almost everyone should be here. And once everyone's here, then I'll start bringing up food, and we can start doing some food tastings, and bring up spices, and smell spices, and not so much taste spices, but smell them and look at them, right? Um, so juniper berries, these are used in a lot of um, cures, okay? So when I say it's something called a cure, it's where we you guys know what bacon is? Bacon? You know bacon? Yeah? So bacon is a cured pork product, right? So it's made with a pork belly, right? And it's covered in salt and sugar and spices, and then it's cured, which means you can eat it, right? Without cooking it, it's fine, right? It's safe to eat. So this is used, these juniper berries are used in a lot of different cured um, German products. Um, it's also used um, as an ingredient in sauces in German food. It goes really well with game meat. Uh, so, where's game? Here it is. Game meat. Does anyone understand what this means? Game meat? Game. Anyone? Speak up.
We call them juniper berries, right? Berry, but they're not really a, a real berry, like strawberry, raspberry. Okay? It's not a true berry, but we give it the name juniper berry because I don't know. Someone, someone one day said, "Oh, this is called the juniper berry," so now we always call it that. But it's not a real, not a real berry. Okay? It's not a fruit. Okay, Kirsch. Uh, so, this is uh, an alcohol. So, you know, in Taiwan we have, um, oh god, what's it called? The rice wine. Uh, you know, 54 degrees, uh, what's that called? Gallia, right? Yeah, Gallia, sorry. Have you ever looked at the commercials for Gallia? They're really funny, huh? Have you ever seen on the TV? TV commercial with some guy, you know, he's got a suit on, he's like, yeah, takes a shot of Galleon, he's like, ah. Have you ever had Galleon? It's terrible. Like, I had one shot, I'm like, oh, Jesus. Like, I look at this commercial, I'm like, that guy is not enjoying that shot of Galleon, that's for sure. Anyways, uh, so this would basically be like German Galleon, okay? Kirsch is made. From cherries, you know this fruit, right? Cherries, yeah. Uh, so it's a distilled um, drink made from cherries. All right. Do you understand distillation? Distilled. You guys know beer, yeah? Fijo or uh, Hongjo wine, yeah. So that's made from fermentation. Fermentation is where we take fruit or a product. You know kimchi. Kimchi, right? You know how kimchi is made? We put salt on cabbage and then we let it bubble. That's fermentation. Okay? Fermentation. You need to start, if you don't understand these terms, you need to start looking on the internet uh, culinary terms. You know, fermentation. So fermentation is where we develop a bacteria, good bacteria. Do you remember from hygiene sake I told you we have good and bad bacteria? Some bacteria is good for us, some bacteria is bad for us. Fermentation, such as the process of making kimchi, or beer, or wine, fermentation is how we make alcohol, okay? Fermentation, the bacteria eats the fruit. So in here, we have cherries, right? Inside the cherry, we have sugar, okay? The bacteria eats the sugar, right? That's its food source and it works, and it makes alcohol and gas, okay? That alcohol is what gives this product its power, right? Same like beer, same like wine, okay? Beer is made from fermentation, whereas this is made from distillation. So the cherries are fermented to make um, an alcoholic drink, which is then heated up, Okay, we add heat. Water boils at about 100 degrees Celsius, 99 degrees Celsius. Alcohol boils at about 60 degrees Celsius. So as the liquid heats up, the alcohol evaporates with some water, and then it goes down a tube where it cools down, and it becomes vodka or gin or kirsch. Okay, that's distillation. That's why this is clear. Okay? Vodka, gin, all those drinks, whiskey, they're all clear, right? They're not cloudy like beer or wine, okay? So that's distillation. So Kirsch is used in a lot of cooking in Germany. Um, it's used in a lot of desserts. Um, it can also be drink, drunk, uh, for example, at the end of dinner. So in Germany or Austria or Switzerland, after they eat, they have something called an aperitif. Okay, that's after dinner, after tea. That means something that's drank after dinner. Okay, after you eat, it's drunk to help digest the food. So kirsch is very commonly used um, as an after tea. It's also very commonly used in pastries. Uh, for example, uh, black forest cake. Okay, so this is a German cake, which is different in Germany, but very famous German cake. 
pastry, black forest cake. So kirsch is used to make this. It's very often that kirsch is brushed onto the cake layers inside the cake. Okay, to give it some flavor and to keep it moist. All right. So kirsch is a very commonly used alcohol in German cooking and in Austrian cooking. Uh, okay, kohlrabi. So this here, this is called kohlrabi. Okay, kohlrabi. Often it's also referred to as a ger German turnip. Um, it's actually not a turnip. It's part of the cabbage family. So like cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi. It's the same family. This, I would say, um, the most common, the closest thing in Taiwan that we have to this would be uh, local, okay, or daikon. You know daikon? Local? You know? Daikon? You know local dog? You know local? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. So this would be the closest thing that I can think of in Taiwan that you would know would be daikon. The, the texture, okay, would be similar, but the taste is more like broccoli, okay? So the texture, the, the, the feel, right, in your mouth, mouth feel, would be similar to lobo or daikon, um, but it tastes more like broccoli, okay? So this is called kohlrabi. Uh, it's used a lot uh, raw or it can be cooked. So it's quite often used in salads, uh, or garnishes, things like that. Um, but it's also very commonly cooked. All right, so that's kohlrabi. Um, also called the German uh, turnip. Another thing here is leeks, which I think we talked about before. When we talked about French cooking, we talked about something called mirepoix. Do you remember that? The very first meat. Do you remember that? Or not? You have to remember these things because when it comes to your test, your midterm and your final exam, this stuff will be on your test. This is a really important ingredient in Western cooking. It's used a lot in France, it's used a lot in Spain, it's used a lot in Germany, it's used a lot in Austria, it's used a lot in Switzerland, it's used a lot everywhere. So this is part of the onion family, okay? <clears throat> uh, this leaf is not to be confused with a Chinese leaf. Okay, there's, there's a Chinese leaf which is very, very skinny, okay? This is very, very thick, okay? So a Western leaf or a European leaf, okay, is very, very thick, it's very, very big, okay? Whereas a Chinese leaf is much skinnier, uh, it's a little more soft, okay? So you can eat the whole thing. Normally in Western cooking, the top of the leaf we take off, and we use that for making chicken stock or soup, something like that, right? And then we just use this part from here to here, uh, we use that in our cooking, okay? And again, this, like I said, this is part of the onion family, so its flavor profile is similar to an onion, right? It's sort of a, in between an onion and a green onion, okay? So a green onion is very mild, right? The taste, not so strong. An onion is quite strong, right? This is kind of in the middle. Not so strong as an onion, not so nice as a green onion. All right, but not to be confused with the Chinese leaf. Very, very different. Okay, I often, often here, ask students to order leaves, and what I get, Chinese leaf. Right, so they're not the same thing. All right. Uh, Lincoln berry. So this is a, this is a real berry, an actual fruit berry. Uh, so this grows wild in a lot of parts of um, Northern Europe. It also grows wild in some parts of North America. So like where I'm from in Canada, uh, we have a lot of this type of fruit. Um, it's got a very, uh, it's got a very tart or sour taste. So when I say sour, I think of something like a lemon, okay? But when I say tart, tart, have you ever heard the word tart before? T-A-R-T. Have you heard that word before? Can you 
Can you think of some, how do you, how do you describe that in Chinese? Because it's different, sour and tart are not the same, right? Sour is like, tart is like. But, but in Chinese, how would, you, how would you describe something as tart? Is there a word for tart in Chinese? Not really, right? Not, I don't know. I, I know there's sour in Chinese, right? But tart, there's no word, right? And yet. What? Yeah, you don't have to ask. Do you, do you say, can you Google it? Or can you go? You want to go? Yeah, Google it. Go. Google it. And, and any time, you're free to Google things, right? If I find you guys playing, you know, Candy Crush or TikToking or whatever, then your phone is going to go out the window. But if you're using your phone for what it's supposed to be used for, getting information, that's totally fine. So the word tart, it's hard to describe. It's not sour, but it's, it's, it likes sour. Can anyone think, have you guys found it in Chinese? Or have you Googled it? Tart, T-A-R-T. -T. Not the pastry, not the pastry. Because there's a tart, which is a pastry. You eat a tart, but the taste is tart. Did you find it? Did you find it? Tart, T-A-R-T. -T. The taste? It's like sour, but it's not sour. Do you understand what I mean? So similar to what I said about leeks, right? Leeks are like an onion and like a green onion, right? They're kind of in the middle. Tart is all the way to sour town, right? But it's not quite sour. It's just a little. And it's hard to describe. That's that's what lingonberries berries taste like. They have a very tart, uh, tart taste. Okay. Almost like when you eat something and you have to drink water right away. That's kind of like what tart is. You eat something you're like. And you have water. Okay? Um, so these lemon berries, they're used a lot because of their tart flavor, they're used a lot in um, jam, for making jam. Uh, they're used a lot for sauces to add a different profile, a different flavor to sauces. Um, and they're found all over the place um, in wild, you know, in the wild, right? They grow in bushes. Of course, when you're picking berries, right, you have to know which ones are safe and which ones are poisonous, right? Some berries, some berries like this, right? If you eat them, delicious. Some berries like this, you eat them, you're dead. Okay? I know, it's hilarious, right? <laughs> That's so funny. He ate those berries, now he's dead. What an idiot. Um, funny though, when I was a kid, my, my parents' house had a lot of fruit, you know, my, my family's home. We had a cherry, a cherry tree, and blackberries, and strawberries, and we also had wild berries. And there was two plants. One of them can eat, the other one cannot eat. It's poisonous. So I always told my brother, go eat those berries. And my mom's going to stop eating it. Um, at any rate, uh, these kinds of berries are really, really nice for jam, because normally when you make jam, you have to add a lot of sugar. So this flavor, because it's tart, it goes well with sugar, okay? Some jam, so for example, strawberry jam, okay? My wife, she doesn't really like strawberry jam. She says it's too sweet. But jams like this, because they're more sour or tart, she likes it because the sugar and the flavor of this berry together is more balanced. Strawberries already are sweet, right? And then you add a lot of sugar to the jam, is very, very sweet, right? So these kind of berries are great for making jam. Um, and this is a photo of lingonberry jam. Uh, Morello cherries. So this is a variety of cherry uh, that is fairly common in Germany. Um, this type of cherry is very common in the area of Germany called Black Forest. Which, if you remember back to Kirsch, we had the Black Forest cake. Yeah? So that cake is from <laughs> Black Forest, Germany. That's where it gets its name. Although, if you go to Germany, has anyone here been to Germany? No? Okay. If you go to Germany, 
things that we have here, or even in the West, uh, when I say the West, I mean like Canada and North America, um, things that we have in North America or even in Taiwan that we think are German are very different than when you actually go to Germany. The food is very different. Okay? So uh, these Morello cherries, uh, they're commonly grown in, um, in southern Germany and around the Black Forest region. Uh, they have a little bit of a sour taste. So when we talk about cherries, we have sweet cherries and sour cherries. So all cherries go into two categories. Okay? They're either sweet cherries or sour cherries. And then in those groups, we have different kinds. Okay? So you can, you know, sweet cherries, there's lots of different types of cherries. And sour cherries, there's different types of sour cherries. This particular one is quite sour. Um, you'll often find them here like this. Uh, if you're not in Germany or somewhere where cherries grow. So for example, in Taiwan, there's no, you don't have cherry trees, right? When you buy cherries, you go to a supermarket, right? You go to Jason's, Costco. I don't think PX Mark carries cherries. Maybe they do, I don't know. But if you go to a store to buy a package of cherries, right? When I was a kid, I'd go outside, my backyard, Back in stuff. We have a cherry tree, right? But in Taiwan, it's too hot, right? The temperature is too hot. Um, so often, when you find uh, sour cherries like this, they'll become um, sold in jars like this, and they'll be packaged in sort of a light syrup. So a very light sugar water, so a little bit of sugar, a little bit of water, boiled, and then they're packaged in jars like this and sold. Once they're packaged in jars like this, they become a little bit sweeter because they're sitting in sugar water. Okay, so you can eat them like this. Um, these are used in a lot of pastries, uh, like Danish, a Danish pastry or cakes, like Black Forest cake. Uh, they're used in desserts, they're used in ice cream, very, very good ice cream from this type of cherry, excellent ice cream. Uh, they're used to make spirits, like alcohol drinks. And it's a very, very useful product, uh, sour cherry. Uh, but they're not very good for just eating, okay? So, for example, if you go to Costco in Taiwan, you get cherries there called black cherries. Those are from North America, and they're very sweet. These, they're not so good for just eating, right? If you ate one, you'd be like, Ooh. right? They're very sour. So it's better for cooking in dessert because you're adding sugar, okay? So they're quite sour. Parsnip. Uh, so this looks a lot like a carrot, right? Very, very similar to a carrot. Uh, it's not a carrot. It's called a parsnip. P-A-R-S-N-I-P, parsnip. Um, it's very closely related to a carrot, so they're the same family. Um, however, this particular vegetable, it's got a very, um, you can see here, it's very, very wide at the top. But down here, it gets very, very skinny. And so when you look at them, they look kind of like a carrot, but you can tell something is different. Normally, a carrot is more, you know, it's kind of thick at both ends, right? Whereas the parsnip that starts thick, it gets very, very skinny. So the end of the parsnip is very small. A parsnip um, has a taste kind of peppery or similar to wasabi or horseradish. Okay? Not as strong. So when you eat wasabi, it's very powerful, right? Very strong, right? If you just take some fresh wasabi and eat it, right? A parsnip is slightly less peppery, less strong. Okay? It's got a very mild, very soft pepper taste. Okay? Also, uh, parsnips have a texture almost like a potato, a cooked potato. So you know uh, mashed potato or french fries? You know soup yao? Yeah, you know the inside is very creamy, right? That's kind of like the, um, the texture of a parsnip is similar to a potato when it's cooked. Okay, it's got a very soft kind of potato-like texture, very starchy. So that's called a uh, parsnip. 
And again, we'll use these um, in our cooking class so that you get a chance to cook it, taste it, smell it, use it, okay? Pollock, uh, so this is a type of fish very commonly used um, in uh, Northern Europe. It's also very commonly used in uh, North America. Um, so in Europe, they eat this fish uh, as any other fish, right? They just catch it, cook it, eat it, okay? What you probably, you've probably all eaten this type of fish before. I guarantee you for sure you've eaten this fish, call it. However, you've probably eaten it like this. You know, fake crab, right? This fish is used to make this. So you, I guarantee you, you all eat this, right? Yeah? None of you, I know you don't like fish, right? But most of you have eaten this before, right? Yeah, fake crab, right? Imitation crab. It's like crab, but not really crab, right? This fish is used entirely to make this product, okay? So you all, all of you have eaten this fish, right? But you didn't even know, right? Uh, but in, in, um, in Europe and in North America, we still catch this fish and eat it just like any other fish, right? It's a good fish. It's very mild tasting. It's got very lean white meat. Um, so it's quite popular. Uh, but you, you guys will be more commonly known for that imitation crab, okay? So that's called pollock, P-O-L-L-O-C-K, pollock. Pollock is used to make imitation crab. Uh, quark, okay, so uh, quark is a type of cheese used in Northern Europe. Uh, quark is used Q U A R K, quark. Um, it's quite an interesting name. Um, so, this is a really common cheese used in Northern Europe, especially in Germany, Austria, Norway, Sweden, Denmark. So, when I talk about Northern Europe, look at the map, right? The map is back there. So, all of these countries up here and up here, Northern Europe. Not down here, southern Europe, but northern Europe, up here. These countries use quark a lot um, because it's an easy cheese to make. <clears throat> so, we talked about cheese a couple different times already, right? We talked about French cheese, Italian cheese, Spanish cheese, right? So, I talked a little bit about how cheese is made. So, cheese is made by taking milk and splitting it, okay? And this is what happens when you split milk, okay? When you heat up milk and you acidify it, you add an acid, okay, it separates. And you're left with two things, the whey and the curd, okay? This is called the whey, W-H-E-Y, whey, whey, W-H-E-Y, whey, and this is called the curd, C-U-R-D, okay? You can look those up. Make notes, right? You can look it up on Google. Um, whey is uh, the liquid left from a dairy product. Okay, and this can be used. This can be used for a lot of different things. Uh, for example, a lot of people that work out, okay, they take uh, protein uh, shake, right? They use this to make the protein, the whey. Okay, the curd is the solid part from the milk. Okay? So milk gives us two things, whey and curd. Okay? This particular cheese here is called pork. So it's very similar to other fresh cheeses. We talked already in this class about things like ricotta cheese uh, or mascarpone cheese, right, from Italy. So those are two fresh cheeses that are very similar to pork. The difference is the amount of acid used, um, the percentage of milk fat used. So when you, when, you, when you buy milk, right? Let's say you go to the store, right? You want to get some milk? You want to make myself a latte? You have different kinds of milk, right? It's not just one kind, right? In Canada and North America, we have like six kinds of milk. 
We have low fat, extra low fat, we have 2%, 1% skim milk, uh, extra fat milk, full fat milk, so many choices of milk. Here we have two, right? We have fresh milk and low fat milk, right? So what they're talking about is the milk fat. Every dairy product on the package, the label, will say MF percent. You know what MF percent means? You know what percent?
go for the teacher, I need to go poo poo. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't need to know that. Okay, I'm not your mom. Obviously, I'm not your mom. But just get up, go to the bathroom, come back. Okay? Alright. So, 10 minutes, we'll start back up. And, uh, yeah.
You know what sweet means, right? So the opposite of sweet is savory. So salad, soup, chicken, main course is all savory food. Food is either savory or sweet. You understand what I mean? Yeah? Okay. So remember those two terms. Don't, it won't be on a test. So don't worry about that. But remember savory and sweet. If someone says to you, oh, I want something savory, that means they want something not sweet, okay? Something salty. But we don't use the word, oh, I want something salty. Because then maybe, you know, cooks, cooks are very stupid. You know, cooks are really dumb. You have to tell them everything exactly over. They're really stupid. So if you say to a cook, oh, I want something salty, he's probably going to think, oh, I put more salt. Because he said, I want salt. Uh, I just don't want it sweet. Right, so savory is what we use for salty foods. Sweet is what we use for dessert food. Okay? So sea buckthorn is something we use in both applications, whether it's savory or sweet. Okay, very, very useful product. Um, it's becoming more popular now um, with a lot of chefs. It's really important as well, uh, if you're really interested in food, and cooking, and cuisine, is to research, okay? Go on the internet. Uh, there's a lot of, if you want, I can give you some different websites to look at um, to stay kind of current. You know, what's popular, what's trendy, what chefs are doing, what chefs are using. You know, stay, it's good to know classical food, right? Because classical food is what makes modern food, right? And if you don't know classical food, you won't be very good at making modern food, okay? But it's also important to stay current with what's going on, okay? So this is a product that's becoming more and more popular uh, in Western cooking, okay? Sea buckthorn. Sweet mustard, uh, so this is also known as uh, Bavarian mustard. So in Germany, in the southern part of Germany, uh, we have an area called Bavaria, okay? Bavaria is one of the more famous regions of Germany. Have you ever heard of Oktoberfest? It's a very popular beer festival in Germany where they have the big glasses of beer and the ladies carry all the beer around, you know, Oktoberfest. Yeah, it's actually in September, but they call it Oktoberfest. Yeah, in Germany. Uh, so this um, particular type of mustard, so we've talked already about uh, Dijon mustard, right, in France. And Dijon mustard is very strong, right, it's very, very sharp. Okay, it's got a very strong taste. This particular type of mustard is much sweeter. Now, when I say sweeter, I don't mean sweet. Okay? It's not sweet. It's sweeter when compared to other mustard. Okay? When, when we talk about food, remember that uh, when we talk about like terminology, when I say something is sweeter, that doesn't mean that it's sweet. It means that compared to another thing, it's sweeter. So compared to French mustard, Dijon mustard, and again, when more students are here, I'm going to bring up all kinds of mustard, and we're going to, we're going to taste all the mustards, okay? Well, not all the mustards, but a lot of mustard. This particular mustard is just sweeter than the French style mustard, okay? And this is very, very common in Bavaria, which is in the southern part of Germany. For example, I, I get a little bit crazy, I have a lot of German friends. I used to work in Germany, uh, so I have a lot of friend, friends that are chefs in Germany. And they get, sometimes they come to visit me in Taiwan, you know, we go for food or whatever, right? We go to a, a German restaurant here in Taiwan, and they give us some sausages, and they give us the yellow mustard, like an American mustard, right? And my German friends say, oh, Jesus, you know, they get crazy. Because in, in Germany, they only use this kind of mustard for sausages, sweet mustard, never American mustard. Okay. So this is really common um, to eat as a dip with German sausage, which again, next semester in butchery class, we're going to make two kinds of German sausage. Um, bratwurst, which we already talked about in this class, right? Bratwurst, we talked about earlier last week in this class. Bratwurst sausage and Weisswurst, which we're going to talk about shortly. Um, but yeah, so this is um, very common in German cooking. Uh, and turnips, uh, so again, uh, this is a root vegetable. Uh, it's very, very dense, similar to like a carrot or uh, 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 daikon or lobo, right? It's got a similar sort of dense uh, structure. Uh, turnips got also quite a strong taste. Um, so it's used a lot in German cooking because German cooking is very 
big, okay? German flavors are very big, okay? You know a lot of Taiwanese cuisine is very mild, right? Very, very subtle flavors, right? Uh, not, you know, like beef noodle soup, okay, for example, right? Beef noodle soup is not very strong tasting. It's got a lot of subtle flavors, right? Like licorice, tangerine, cinnamon, right? The spices are very mild, so it's a very delicate taste. German, German cooking is more pronounced, more big. Okay, there's lots of big flavors. And so for that reason, turnips are very popular in Germany. Um, and they're cooked like any other root vegetable. Okay, you can boil them, you can bake them. Okay? Uh, you can eat them raw, but it's less common to eat them raw. It's more common that they're cooked. Okay? So another classic German sausage, which like I said, we're going to make in butchery class next semester. So if you, if you look in this PowerPoint, which I'll load onto your e-learning, or I think I already did, in the beginning of the German section, there's a, another sausage called Bratwurst, okay, which is a brown sausage. This is Weisswurst, which means uh, white sausage. Okay, As you can see, it's white. right? That's why it's called white sausage, Weisswurst. This, this sausage uh, traditionally is made with veal. Veal is a baby uh, cow. Yeah, it's called Chavignoro, right? Which is not a common product in Taiwan. It's very expensive here. It's also not eaten that much. But in Europe, baby cows are eaten a lot. Okay? Uh, so traditionally, this is made using veal. Okay? Right here, veal, V E A L, which is Chavignoro, small, small cow. Um, however, nowadays, because veal is so expensive, nowadays it's usually made with veal and pork. Okay, so it's a mixture of two meats. Okay, but traditionally it's made with just veal, which is how we keep the white color. Okay. Again, when we get into butchery, I'll explain more about uh, meat. Okay. As I said in the earlier class, we talked about bratwurst. Okay, which is a, another sausage. That's made with one kind of pork, and this is made with another kind of pork. So different, uh, different parts of the pig, when they cook, are different colors, right? You understand what I mean? Not all pork is brown, not all pork is white. You get different colors from different sections of the animal. And so we'll talk a lot more about this in butchery class next semester. And we'll make this and eat this and all that jazz. So that's white source, okay? Very, very common sausage in Germany. All right, Switzerland. Uh, so Switzerland is a very unique country. Um, Switzerland is what we call a neutral country. It uh, has never been involved in a war. So you guys know World War I, World War II, right? Very, very important periods in history. Maybe we're soon going to be in World War III. I don't know. My good friend Xi Jinping is, uh, I don't know, very sensitive like that. Uh, anyways, Switzerland has never been in a war. They always say we don't want any part. We're, we're neutral. We're not for these guys. We're not for these guys. We're just, we're just, just we just want to eat chocolate. So Switzerland has always been um, fairly neutral, fairly. Um, very unconnected in terms of geopolitical things. But the good thing about Germany is that it borders on a lot of countries. So Germany, oh sorry, Germany, Switzerland, oh I said Germany, Switzerland borders a lot of countries. So in Switzerland, you have three major uh, cultures. You're either Swiss German, meaning that you are from the German side of Switzerland and you speak German, or you're Swiss French, meaning you're from the French side of Switzerland, meaning you speak French, or you're Swiss Italian, meaning that you come from the Italian side of Switzerland and you speak Italian. Uh, I've worked with a lot of Swiss guys. Most people from Switzerland speak all three languages. Usually they speak four. English, French, German, and Swiss. Most of the time, okay? So depending on where they're from, that dialect that we use there, and also the type of food. So if you're from the German side of Switzerland, the cuisine is more influenced by Germany. If you're from the Swiss, or sorry, the French side of uh, uh, Switzerland, or from the Swiss side, uh, sorry, 
If you're from the French side of Switzerland, the cuisine is more influenced by France, okay? And if you're from the Italian side of Switzerland, your cuisine is more influenced by Italian cuisine, okay? Switzerland is also fairly landlocked. Um, so you can see here on the map, there is no real oceans by Switzerland, right? So what I say here, the little term landlocked, right here, landlocked means that there's no access to oceans, okay? Taiwan, not landlocked, right? Very accessible to oceans. Switzerland, there's the closest oceans, see? So it's very far. So you can see here, Italy, Germany, and France, okay? A little bit of Austria as well, but we consider it basically, this is the German side, Italian side, and French side, okay? And so the culture there um, is quite a mixture of different um, countries from outside. Switzerland also has a lot of geographic uh, diversity, very similar to Taiwan. Think about Taiwan, you go to the coast, you're right by the ocean, right? And you drive a couple hours in, you're up to the mountain, right? Switzerland is the same way. Um, if you go to the lakes or rivers, you're going to be very close to the sea level. But Switzerland also has a very high mountains, much higher than Taiwan, right? They have a lot of snow, a lot of skiing, right? That's a big part of their culture. Um, so, we talked about, um, in Germany, they had Kirsch, okay? Remember the alcohol made from cherries? Okay, Kirsch. This one is called Absinthe. So this is a Swiss alcohol, okay? Um, uh, it's, a, it's slightly green color, okay? It's very, very strong. I mean, it can be very strong. So normally, for example, like vodka, okay? It's 40% alcohol, right? This is 70%, right? So almost twice as strong as vodka. So it's a very, very powerful alcohol. Um, it used to be a lot of countries, a lot of countries uh, wouldn't allow absinthe because they thought it was bad, you know? But now it's becoming more popular, so a lot of countries have decided it's okay, we allow absinthe in. Uh, so you can make drinks with absinthe, but it's normally drank straight, no, no mix, okay? It's also very common uh, when you're drinking absinthe to put absinthe, you have a sugar cube here, so a small cube of sugar, and you pour, you light the absinthe on fire, and you pour the, the ignited absinthe over the sugar cube, and that dissolves the sugar cube into the glass, and then you drink it. So it has a little bit of sugar in it, so it's a little bit sweeter, okay? That's a really common way um, to drink absinthe. Uh, brown trout, so this is a, a really common fish, um, not only in Switzerland, but also in a lot of different European countries, also in North America. So this is a freshwater fish, so this would be fish out of lakes or rivers, not the ocean. This fish is part of the same family as salmon, okay? So the salmon family includes trout. You can actually see they look, they look very similar to salmon. Okay? Trouts are usually smaller than salmon. They have a very uh, similar mouth. Okay? If you look at the mouth of the trout, it's quite similar to the mouth of the salmon because they're in the same family. Uh, this particular type of fish is really, really popular in not only Europe but also North America. It has a, a similar uh, meat like salmon. You know, salmon, the color of salmon, it's like kind of pink, red or pink, right? You know salmon, right? Salmon? You know? Yes? Salmon? What color is salmon? Orange. I don't know what kind of, that's Donald Trump's orange. More like her mouse, right? More like pink, yeah? Pinkish red. Same is for trout. Okay, trout is the same color. Slightly, slightly pink, slightly red. Definitely not orange. Um, so trout is really commonly cooked, caught, and cooked like normal fish, right? Sauté, grilled, barbecue, not so much steam. 
Um, it's also very commonly cured, which again, we'll do next semester in butchery class. We'll take a fish, we'll cover it with salt and sugar, we'll leave it for a few days, and you can eat it straight, okay? No cooking, okay? So very common that it's cured, or it can also be smoked, which also next semester we will smoke some fish. So next semester there's going to be a lot of eating in butchery class all the time. First few weeks, nothing, but then after about the fifth week, we're just going to be eating, eating, eating all the time. So that's brown trout, although there are a lot of types of trout, okay? Trout is a really common fish, okay, but it's not salt water, it's fresh water. You understand the difference between salt water and fresh water, right? You understand the difference? Salt water, fresh water, you know, right? It's not the same thing, right? If you go to Bai Sha Wan, Bai Sha Wan, it's salt water, right? You go to Sun Lake, fresh water, right? So the types of fish are different, okay? So that's brown trout. Uh, Emmental cheese, uh, again, I'll bring in some Emmental cheese when we, when we try all the cheeses later, which we're going to see here. Uh, so this is uh, a really tight, a really famous type of cheese from Switzerland. Okay, Emmental or Emmental. Uh, some people call it Swiss cheese, but it's really called Emmental cheese. Uh, so you can see all these holes, right? So all of these holes are made by the gas that the bacteria produces. So as the bacteria starts to eat the protein in the milk to make the cheese, it gives off gas, right? And that gas starts to make holes in the cheese. And that's where we get all these little holes throughout the cheese. Originally, in Switzerland, cheese makers tried to avoid making the holes. They, they thought that the best thing to was with no holes. But now, the more holes, the better. They think that it's a sign of proper aging, proper cheese making. That if you have holes, the bacteria has, has lived, and it's aged, and it's better cheese. So the, the, the thought about cheese has changed. So that's Emmental cheese. Um, Emmental is used in a lot of different cooking. Um, and we'll use it in our classes, in our basic Western cooking classes. We'll use it a lot next semester, and also in your second, second year. Second year, we'll use a lot of Emmental cheese, and a lot of cheese in a lot of our dishes, so uh, you'll have a chance to uh, taste it, try it, cook with it, and use it. So that's Emmental cheese. Gruyere cheese is another type of cheese uh, made from Switzerland. Um, so this is uh, <coughs> made in a similar way. The method of making this cheese is similar to that of Gruyere cheese. However, this, as you can see, has no holes, okay? Occasionally, Gruyere will have some holes, but usually it's made with no holes, okay? Um, because they add more salt, so that kind of controls the bacteria, okay? When we talk in hygiene and safety class, we're gonna talk about bacteria more uh, later, uh, so you'll understand how bacteria grows, okay? It's important to understand how a thing functions, and then you can understand how to control it. Um, again, Gruyere cheese, very, very common cheese in Switzerland. It's also a very, very popular cheese outside of Switzerland. Okay? This is one of the more exported cheeses. Emmental and Gruyere cheese are two very large export products from Switzerland. Do you understand the word export? Yeah, import, export. Right? Taiwan exports computers. Right? Taiwan imports beef. Okay? So Switzerland, a lot of cheese is exported from the country because it's very, very popular. Lamb lettuce. Uh, so lamb lettuce is also very, very common lettuce, uh, not only in Switzerland, but in areas around Switzerland. Uh, this looks a lot like baby spinach. Or very, very small spinach, but actually it's not the same family as spinach. It's a spinach is in a lettuce, it's a green, um, whereas uh, lamb lettuce is an actual true lettuce. Uh, it's really, really popular because it's got a very nice, uh, delicate taste, it's got a really nice texture. 
Some lettuce is very soft. This one is a little more crunchy. So it's got a nicer texture. Uh, so it's really, really popular um, for salads. Uh, Landjager. Landjager is a really common type of dry sausage. Uh, so this is a very, very dry sausage that is made out of pork and veal uh, or pork and beef. Uh, this is really common. As I mentioned before, Switzerland has a lot of mountains, right? And Swiss people, they love to go hiking up the mountains. So what they do is they take these with them because it doesn't need a refrigerator, right? You can just keep it in your pocket for one week, no problem. So when you're hiking, if you need some energy, Land air, right? Protein. It will give you energy. So this is a really common sausage to be carried around throughout the Swiss Alps when they're uh, going on hikes or going on uh, vacation because it's really easy to transport. It doesn't require a fridge. Chocolate. Now, chocolate, of course, is not from Switzerland. Chocolate's from South America, but. We're going to include it for a little bit here in Switzerland because um, Switzerland is super famous for chocolate. There's different types of chocolate, right? There's dark chocolate, milk chocolate, white chocolate, pink chocolate. Okay? White chocolate isn't actually really chocolate. Okay? It's not considered true chocolate. It's a different thing. So the only real kinds of chocolate are dark chocolate, milk chocolate, and rose chocolate. White chocolate doesn't contain any cocoa liquor, so it's not considered chocolate. <coughs> the reason I put uh, chocolate in here is because um, the Swiss invented milk chocolate. Okay, so milk chocolate is pretty much the most popular type of chocolate. It's the most consumed chocolate. A lot of people don't like dark chocolate because it's got a bitterness to it, right? It's not so sweet. So, um, in generality, uh, milk chocolate is the more consumed type of chocolate because it's sweeter. It's easier to eat. And this was created by the Swiss. Um, the first chocolate bar was invented in the UK, right, Britain, um, a long, long time ago, uh, back in the 1800s. Um, but uh, milk chocolate was invented and created in Switzerland. And Switzerland's got some of the most famous chocolate companies in the world. For example, Nestle. You guys have heard of Nestle before, the company? Right? Very, very big company. They make everything now, not just chocolate. That's a Swiss confectionery company. Um, Lind, L-I-N-D-T, Lind. Lind chocolate is a very uh, sort of a high-end chocolate. You can buy them in Taiwan, they're little balls. Usually they come in blue. Red, black, and orange, I think. Uh, have you ever seen those before? Linden chocolate balls. Very, very high quality. Um, so, for example, if you go to 7 um, Eleven to get a chocolate bar, right, like um, Twix or Snickers, right, that chocolate is the lowest, the lowest possible quality of chocolate there is, okay? And really, really bad, okay? So if you're going to buy chocolate, spend a bit more, get a good quality product, okay? Um, so that is a little bit about chocolate. Um, chocolate and cocoa are from South America. They were brought from South America to Europe. And then from Europe, they created modern chocolate, as we know it, right? Originally, chocolate was not very popular. It was, people didn't like it because it was very bitter. Uh, but then after the French and the Swiss figured out how to make it into proper chocolate, then it became very popular, okay? So chocolate has a very weird history. Now, most of the chocolate made comes from Africa, okay? Um, so like I said, chocolate is originally from South America. Now, 80% of the world's chocolate comes from three countries in Africa. If you look at the map, right here, on this coast here, these three countries, they make 80% of the world's chocolate. One country makes 60% of the world's chocolate. Okay, and then combined, 80%. Indonesia also produces a lot of chocolate, but mostly it comes from Africa. Pipefish, uh, so this is 
another species of um, pretty common fish, or pretty popular fish that's used in a lot of regions around um, Switzerland and also France, Italy, and Germany. Um, pikefish can come from fresh water, so in Switzerland uh, they get it out of lakes and rivers, but pikefish also comes from waters what we call brackish, and that term brackish means when a river meets an ocean, okay, there's a mixture of fresh and salt water, okay? Have you ever looked at a, an ocean or near a river and you've seen almost like two colors of water? It looks different, right? You look at a river and then there's the ocean, it's like one is one color or another color. That's the mixture of fresh water and salt water. And we call that brackish water, okay? So not a lot of fish live or can live in brackish water. Okay? A lot of them either live in salt water or in fresh water. Okay? But some species, like pike, they live in brackish waters. Okay? So we have a mixture of salt and fresh waters. Um, and it's a really mild fish. Um, it's got a very delicate flavor. It's not very strong. It's not a fishy taste. Uh, it's not oily. It's quite lean. Um, so in European cooking, they usually cook it very simply and serve it with very simple uh, side dishes. You know, usually boiled potatoes, maybe some lemon. Okay, but really the fish is left uh, untouched. They want the flavor of the fish to be natural. Okay, they don't usually do a lot with it when they cook it. Rhubarb. Uh, so rhubarb is an interesting vegetable. Uh, so it's a leafy plant uh, that normally for this part here, the stalk, okay, this red stalk. This red portion, it looks a lot like celery. You all know celery, yeah? The vegetable celery, yeah? You know celery? So it's got kind of a U-shape, right? Uh, rhubarb has a similar kind of U-shape like celery, okay? Uh, rhubarb has a, a bitter taste, okay? Uh, so a tart bitterness to it. This is really popular, this part, in uh, sweet applications. So making pies, making cakes, making jam, uh, making fruit sauce. Okay, so anything, anything where you add sugar, rhubarb is quite popular because it has a tart, sour taste. Uh, it's very difficult to get fresh rhubarb in Taiwan, but you can get frozen rhubarb in Taiwan. Uh, another common vegetable, is called Swiss chard, okay? Swiss chard, and these are the same family, okay? But they have a different taste, okay? This one, as you can see, comes in a variety of colors. It is yellow, orange, purple, red, uh, white, even. So this one comes in a variety of colors, whereas uh, rhubarb is just one color, okay? Or two colors, green and red, okay? Uh, but Swiss chard, comes in a variety of colors. This is used uh, not for sweet applications, but savory cooking, okay? It's often cooked as a side, okay? So you have a piece of chicken or a piece of beef with a side dish of char, okay? All right, we're gonna wrap it up there today. Uh, do you have a class in your next? You're in your next? Are you, do you have a class here now, after this class? No, All right. Yes, you have a class? Here? No. Okay. So I asked, do you have a class here? You're like, yeah. No. Hey, I don't know. All right. Um, I'll put this, that PowerPoint on your e-learning today. Uh, don't forget your midterm exam, or sorry, your midterm project, right? You guys are working on that, yeah? Do you guys have any questions about your midterm project? Any questions you want to ask or you understand? <laughs> okay. Um, if you have any questions about the midterm, please ask, okay? Uh, don't wait until it's too late. And of course, no question is a stupid question. All questions are good, okay? I guess the only question I don't want is can I go to the bathroom? You have to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. Okay, uh, so with that being said, uh, I'll see you all, not you, but I'll see the rest of you all back here at what time? 120. Yes, 120 for hygiene safety, okay? Uh, have a nice afternoon, have a nice lunch break. Miller, I'll see you next week. Uh, again, if you have any questions, ask the question.
question. Okay? Don't be scared. Just ask. Okay? All right. Have a good afternoon. We'll see you all later.